Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. During the question and answer session of today's call, you may press star 1 to ask a question. Today's conference is being recorded, and at this time, I'll turn the call to Mr. Dwayne Brown. You may begin, sir. Well, thank you, operator, and good afternoon to everyone. Again, my name is Dwayne Brown with NASA's Office of Communications here at NASA headquarters, and got to tell you, we've got a good one today. Um, a couple of days from now, Wednesday, October 28th, NASA's Cassini spacecraft will sample an extraterrestrial ocean. The spacecraft, when it flies directly through a plume of icy spray coming from Saturn's moon Enceladus, we'll have brief presentations from our Cassini team. They will be using graphics, and uh, just a reminder, those graphics can be obtained at www.nasa.gov slash Cassini slash telecom. That's www.nasa.gov slash Cassini, C-A-S-S-I-N-I, slash telecon, T-E-L-E-C-O-N. This teleconference will be replayed in its entirety for several days. The replay number is 800-391-9851. Again, that's 800-391-9851. Five, one. And, of course, social media is a buzz about what's going to take place in a couple of days. Send in those questions. Social media, they're already coming in. And we will be hearing some of those questions at hashtag AskNASA. Follow the conversation. Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. A lot of excitement. So, extraterrestrial ocean, Wednesday, October 28th. You're here from, starting with Kurt Niebuhr. Cassini Program Scientist at NASA Headquarters in Washington. Earl Mays, Cassini Project Manager at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. And Linda Spilker, a Cassini Project Scientist, also at JPL. So let's get started, and I'll toss it to Kurt. Thank you, Duane. The, the Cassini mission is incredible. Uh, the mission has provided nonstop discoveries for 11 years now and counting. Cassini has demonstrated two things to us over that time span. First, that the universe will continue to surprise and amaze us. And second, that we as a people have the ingenuity and the passion to reveal and to revel in those surprises. Enceladus, a, a tiny, cold, icy moon orbiting Saturn, very distant from the warm sun, has been the source of some of the most amazing and unexpected of our discoveries in the Saturn system. Early in the mission, we discovered jets of water erupting from the south pole of this world, forming a huge plume stretching thousands of kilometers into space. More recently, we learned that just like Jupiter's larger moon Europa, there is a global liquid water ocean under Enceladus' icy crust. And we also discovered evidence that there is hydrothermal activity, reactions between the, the hot rock and the liquid water occurring inside Enceladus at the bottom of that ocean. So Enceladus is not just an ocean world. It's a world that might provide a habitable environment for life as we know it. And while the Cassini spacecraft does not have the instruments needed to detect life, it does have the instruments that can tell us about the characteristics of that ocean. And it is those characteristics that control habitability, that control whether or not life on Enceladus is even a remote possibility. As you can see in the first graphic, uh, which shows a cutaway of, of Enceladus. Uh, the, the ocean that we're talking about covers a huge area, and that's why Enceladus is a world that is becoming a key destination in NASA's search for life. And on Wednesday, we will plunge deeper into that magnificent plume coming from the South Pole than we ever have before, and we will collect the best sample ever from an ocean beyond Earth. And this is an example of where our passion and ingenuity can take us. And this is an example of what NASA is all about. So now I'd like to introduce Earl Mays from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Earl is the project manager for the Cassini mission. Great. Thanks, Kurt. Um, we have a rather prosaic term for this flyby. It's E-21. Uh, it's our 21st Enceladus flyby. Uh, it's not our last, but arguably this one is going to be our most, most dramatic. We're going to be screaming over the South Pole at around 19,000 miles per hour, just 30 kilometers, sorry, sorry, 30 miles above the surface, and we're going to go right through the plume. We've been in the realm of the icy satellites now for a few months. Some of Enceladus's neighbors, Dione and Rhea, have been on our 
our list of targets, but now it's Enceladus. Last couple of weeks ago, we had a phenomenal flyby of the North Pole of Enceladus. First time we have seen this area of the uh, satellite in sunlight, and now it's the South Pole with the plume. Uh, I'm speaking to the graphic. Uh, we have, as I said, been in the, in the ring plane, essentially in the icy satellites, and we're now on approach to Enceladus. About two hours out, we've been imaging all the way in on approach, imaging as usual as prime coming in, but about two hours out, where this animation is now, we will be reorienting the spacecraft so the apertures of both our desk analyzer and spectrometer are going right through the plumes. And if you're watching the animation, uh, it is going to be over in an instant. We are going, like I said, 19,000 miles per hour through the plumes. We'll just take a few tens of seconds. On the egress, we will have a phenomenal view of the backlit plumes against the backdrop of Saturn and the rings. With the uh, data safely on board, we will then begin to reorient the spacecraft for some final imaging. Uh, all this is going to happen about 10 a.m. on Wednesday morning local time, Pacific, uh, daylight, uh, Pacific uh, daylight Savings Time. We will hear our first call back from the spacecraft at about 4.15 that afternoon. That will be just a health and safety call. We're going to reorient the spacecraft for its next encounter, and we will then be able to play back the day over the next couple of days. Although we will be going way too fast to precisely target the surface at closest approach, we're not going to let leave imaging out. Uh, what we'll be able to do is essentially drag the open apertures of the uh, both the high, the uh, narrow angle and wide angle cameras across the surface, shuddering like mad. And if you can look at the ground track of, of the Maze 2 image now, the red line is the ground track of the cameras. Those white circles are the images of the active areas, jets and plumes and or curtains, as you may choose. Um, we hope if you see one of those actually crosses what we've been calling Area 68, which is a very active region at the lower left. And although these images will be quite dramatically smeared because of our velocity, the uh, imaging technology should be able to remove the smear, and we should be able to have some pretty spectacular images for you. One last thing to point out about this image is that, as I pointed out earlier, the North Pole is in daylight for the first time ever. Unfortunately, that means the South Pole is not. And so all of these images will be taken with the ambient lighting from Saturn, in other words, Saturn shine. It'll be a lot like the moonlight we see in, the, in a full moon, uh, but this time it's going to be Saturn providing illumination for the images. And with that, I will turn this over to Linda Spilker, the uh, project scientist for Cassini. Thanks, Earl. I'm going to discuss our planned science and anticipated results from this incredible flyby. Cassini will undertake three main science activities during this flyby, and each activity is designed to provide powerful new insights into the habitability of Enceladus's ocean. We're going to do that by further studying both the gas and the particles coming from the South Pole. Spilker 1 shows the four bluish tiger stripes. What you're seeing is a tiny moon only 300 miles across. Those four bluish features are at the South Pole. Uh, those tiger stripes, this is the source of the gas and the particles coming from the South Pole of Enceladus. The first objective is to confirm the presence of molecular hydrogen in the plume gas. And this will provide an independent line of evidence for the hydrothermal activity that Kurt discussed that's taking place on the seafloor of Enceladus. The amount of hydrogen emission will reveal for us how much hydrothermal activity is actually occurring on that seafloor with implications for the amount of energy that's available, energy a key ingredient for habitability on Enceladus. Cassini's second activity is to better understand the chemistry of the material in the plume. We know we've seen organics, we've seen methane, carbon dioxide, a number of key ingredients, and this, in this case, with our much deeper dive through the plume, we'll have a chance to sample potentially larger particles and a greater density of both the gas and the particles. And we might find new organics that we haven't seen previously or are just at the limits of our detection. In Spilker 2, you can see a video of the plume's continuous emission. Keep in mind the south pole is in darkness, so there'll be actually a shadow line across the plume. We'll get, in particular, images as we fly outbound in what we call forward scattered light to look at this uh, plume coming out of Enceladus. 
And the third and final activity is to, term, to determine the nature of these plume sources. What we wonder, are the plumes created by tight column-like jets or curtain-like eruptions that run along the length of each tiger, fra tiger strike fracture? If you look at Spoker 3, you can see that there's evidence perhaps for jets, but also these curtains of emission. And this is an ongoing source of debate within the scientific community about just what this emission looks like. It also has major implications for how long Enceladus might have been active. And keep in mind, again, that the South Pole is dark, but we'll see the plume as they go up above uh, the surface of Enceladus. We'll get images both inbound and outbound on this flyby, and we'll have a first chance to look at the gas and particle data within about a week of the flyby, a first quick look. And then over the coming weeks, we'll do a more detailed analysis to really help us understand what's going on in that tantalizing ocean on Enceladus. And this flyby may help us unlock more details about the habitability of this very tiny ocean world. And with that, back to you, Kurt, for some concluding remarks. Thank you, Linda. Uh, as I mentioned, this, this flyby can't detect life since we don't have the necessary instruments for that. But it will provide powerful insights as to how habitable the ocean inside Enceladus might be, insights which Linda just described. So I, I hope we've given you a, a good idea of what this flyby means and how very exciting it is for the, the Cassini team. And I hope we've also given you an idea of how exciting it is, not just for us, but for everyone, every, every single one of us on this planet. This is a very big step in a new era of exploring ocean worlds in our solar system. These are worlds with huge bodies of liquid water underneath their surfaces, bodies with great potential. To, uh, to provide oases for life throughout our solar system. It's a journey in understanding uh, about what makes a world habitable and where we might find life and where we might one day live ourselves. And everyone is invited to join us on this journey. Thanks, Kurt, and thanks to a fantastic Cassini team. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, nice and to the point, and we've got plenty of time for questions. So we're now going to transition to Q&A. I'm going to turn it over to the operator to help facilitate that. Uh, we'll take several questions from the media, and then we're going to go to social media. Uh, we're getting um, lots of lots of conversations, so we'll have them uh, get a chance to answer some questions, and then we'll go back to media. So with that, uh, operator, over to you. Thank you. At this time, we're ready to begin the question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. You will be prompted to record your name. To withdraw your question, you may press star 2. Again, star one to ask a question. In one moment, please, for our first question. I think our first question comes from Greg Redfern with WTOP Radio Space Reporter. You may ask your question. Thank you for taking my call. This is for Earl or Linda, and what an exciting mission. But I have essentially two related questions. Have you already identified the plume that you want to fly through, or is there a constant stream of plumes that Cassini will fly by? And number two, exactly or how much light do you expect to fall on the south pole of the moon uh, from Saturn? Thank you so much, and a great mission. Congratulations. Okay, the plume of Enceladus is continuously erupting. Uh, we've seen it throughout the mission, and so we'll be flying through that plume, perhaps even helping resolve the question of the jets versus the curtains. As you could see from that uh, red line on maze 2, that we're going to be going across what appear to be discrete sources and going close enough to perhaps determine if they are discrete sources or part of a larger curtain. As far as the intensity of light falling on uh, the, the moon from Saturn, it's going to be much, much less than the light coming from a full moon. Uh, Saturn is 10 times further away from the sun than the Earth is, so you've got like a factor of 100 decrease in that light. So it'll be dim light, but we have very, very capable cameras, and we've done this before, looking at the dark side of moons and Saturn shine, so we'll be able to get something out of it. Our exposures will be long, so some of those images very close to the South Pole may be smeared, but we think with some processing we can take some of that smear away. And I might add that Enceladus is, Enceladus is very bright, which also helps us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are you ready for the next question? Mm -hmm. 
Jackson, are you ready for the next question? Yes. Thank you. The next question just comes from Bill Harwood with CBS News. Go ahead with your question. Uh, thanks, and I have uh, two very quick ones, uh, one for Earl and one for Linda, if I could. Um, Earl, I think you or someone once said this is kind of like flying through smoke. I just was looking for some general comments on safety of the spacecraft and whether you would have done something like this earlier in the mission than now where you're toward the end of it. Does that make the risk a little more acceptable? And for Linda, you may have said this. I had to step out for 30 seconds, and I apologize, but are we thinking tidal heating alone is responsible for keeping this ocean uh, liquid, or is, is there a component of radioactivity that's doing this, or is it mostly tidal? Thanks. Uh, yeah, that would have been me. I would have said something like that or, or through steam or vapor. Uh, we have flown through the plumes before at a higher altitude, not quite so dense. And so, yeah, this is a little bit riskier, but not that much. We really feel like we're taking a very prudent approach. Uh, at this point in the mission, we still have a couple of years left, a lot of exciting stuff still to do, so we're not going to risk everything on this one flyby. Um, oh, does that help? Yeah, I could add that the particles... Absolutely. The particles themselves, we think, are on the order of about 30 microns or so, so very, very tiny particles uh, and very diffuse also and spread out. As far as the, the source of the energy for Enceladus, uh, we think it's primarily tidal heating. A lot of the radiogenic heating has uh, since uh, gone away. So we think it's primarily tidal heating, although there still is a puzzle because tidal heating, as we best understand it, doesn't quite provide enough energy to maintain Enceladus's ocean liquid, perhaps from the time it formed. So we're working on that one. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question comes from Irene Klotz with Discovery News. You may ask your question. Thanks very much. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first one for Earl. What was the previous uh, closest encounter um, over the Enceladus Southern Pole, and uh, for Linda, um, I understand that um, uh, Cassini is not a life-detecting uh, mission at all, but is there um, any chance at all that uh, the analysis of the, um, the gases and the dust could uh, turn up anything that would kind of shed light on biosignatures at all, or is that for another mission? Thanks. Yeah. Next closest uh, to the plumes was 50, clump, 50 miles, sorry, and uh, not through the uh, densest part of the plumes as we're doing now. Yes, yeah, so over the South Pole it was about 50 miles, so we're, we are going considerably closer. Yeah. But I think our closest flyby of Enceladus um, was 15 miles, right? Uh, but that was not through the plumes. So we're not concerned. We know exactly where we are and where Enceladus is, uh, the plume density that we're working on now. As far as the, the life detection with Cassini, we can really only detect complex organics. Uh, we don't have the range of mass detection to find anything that would look like DNA or, or larger molecules that would indicate life. But we can really do a lot with Cassini to address how habitable is that ocean on Enceladus. So it really remains for another mission, uh, perhaps a series of flybys with the right instrumentation, maybe an Enceladus orbiter, or perhaps a sample return mission to bring back samples of that material, then use the sophisticated instruments on Earth to take a look at that material. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jason Ryan with SpaceFlighterInsider.com. Go ahead with your question. I'm sorry, Bill already asked my question. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question then comes from Peter Spots with the Christian Science Monitor. Go ahead with your well, question. Well, thank you very much for doing this, and I think this is for uh, Linda Spolker. Uh, I wonder if you could uh, return to the uh, curtain versus uh, uh, sort of collimated plume uh, idea and kind of give us a sense for what difference that makes to what ideas about these conduits or about the sources or whatever. Uh, in the case of the jets, you'd have discrete individual, you can think of like little nozzles spraying out this material into space, whereas in the curtain analogy, it would be more like a continuous crack that's open, similar to a lava curtain that you might see in Hawaii. And so it just uh, helps us better understand how do you interact through the ice shell up onto the surface. And so that's what we're trying to uh, figure out the difference between those two. 
Thank you. My next question comes from Alexandra Whitsey with Nature Magazine. You may ask your question. Yes, thanks for taking my question. Um, I think my question is for Earl. I just wanted to ask specifically about the timing of when we're expecting perhaps the most dramatic images from the passage. What I would expect would be sometime late in the evening of Thursday. Um, we have a track right after the flyby, but because of the way the uh, orbital dynamics are, we've got to do a cleanup maneuver right then. So we won't get much playback on the first day. The second day, we've got one of the largest antennas down in Canberra, 70 meter, playing back all day, but it starts about 4.15 in the afternoon. So the imaging and all of the, the uh, close, closest encounter flyby data will come back then. It's going to take some time to process and clean them up. I wouldn't hold out hope for anything before Thursday evening and most likely Friday or into the weekend because of the complexities of removing the smear. So, Operator, this is uh, Dwayne Brown. We are going to um, come back to the media calls. We're going to uh, go now to social media. And, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, Jason Townsend, our social media manager. Uh, we're going to take uh, several questions from social media, and then we'll come back with your media calls. Jason? Sure. Our first question comes from Twitter user Sam, who asks, will the plumes alter the course of the Cassini ship? No. It's, we're going so fast, and it's really so so diffuse that it will have little. It'll have no effect that we can measure on the trajectory of the spacecraft. Great. Next question comes from Twitter user Melanie, who asks, "What would resolving the jets versus curtains question tell us about the moon?" Uh, resolving this question would tell us about how the ocean is interacting with the surface. Whether you have individual little conduits coming up or basically sort of a, a, an open crack that goes all the way to the bottom of the ocean. And this would just help us better understand this interaction and maybe tell us more about the, the thermal energy also coming out of these fractures. Our next question comes from Twitter user David, who asks, what hypotheses are there about why the geysers only occur on the South Pole? That's a very good question, and one we've pondered about. Uh, our flyby just two weeks ago, we looked carefully at the North Pole for possible evidence of activity that may have occurred there in the past. Uh, we think that for some reason that there's a, just a region there at the South Pole. Maybe it didn't start out at the South Pole, but perhaps a weaker region closer to the ocean developed these fractures, and then perhaps it actually rotated down to the South Pole. Going to one or the other poles is the the most favorable orientation from it, but that's a very good question. Wonderful. Next question comes from Twitter user James who asks, habitability, what life forms do you imagine could be living on Enceladus? Well, if we use an analogy to Earth's oceans and the kinds of life you find near the hydrothermal vents, uh, you could perhaps ha have a very diverse kind of life there if it's very similar to what we see on the Earth from maybe small kind of diatoms, you know, individual-celled creatures, perhaps up to things that are even more complex. And, and one more, and then, Operator, we will go back to the media calls. Uh, so one more social media, and then back to you, Operator. Just following on the same theme as the last question, Twitter user Carlton asks, if life exists in the Enceladus subsurface ocean, how advanced could it be, or might it be? That's an intriguing question. Again, if you use the uh, hydrothermal vents on the Earth's seafloor, you don't tend to get extremely advanced kinds of life. There's no sunlight there. You're in liquid water. You might get tiny fish, something like that. So certainly not advanced to the to advancement of, like, human, human beings. But I, I think the, the important discovery that life would generate, uh, regardless of how complex it was, whether it was just bacteria or fish, or, or whatever. The important aspect of that <coughs> is that life exists somewhere else. And if it, if it arose twice in one solar system, the implications for how probable and how frequent it arises in the universe as a whole are profound. So, Operator, this is uh, Dwayne Brown. If we can go ahead and uh, continue with the uh, media call in and just go down the list, please. Thank you. Our next question comes from Tracy Watson with USA Today. Go ahead with your question. Thanks. C 
could uh, Dr. Spilker talk about what it would mean to find different levels of hydrogen? You know, what, what will that tell you, and how does that relate to habitability? And I take it there was some question about earlier measurements and whether the hydrogen levels you saw were an artifact or whether they really were representative of the plume. Uh, do you think you've got that lit? Thanks. We're configuring our ion and neutral mass spectrometer in a mode where it will be most sensitive to detecting molecular hydrogen. And so we'll be looking for that. We expect uh, to see it coming if you, again, use the analogy of the hydrothermal vents on the Earth. And so in that case, we're, we're going to try and look for it. The amount of hydrogen would simply be a reflection of the amount of activity, of hydrothermal activity taking place in Enceladus's ocean. And how does that reflect whether or not there's life? If you, if you, see, if you see a kind of a threshold amount, would you say, oh, pretty, pretty likely that we have some kind of bacterial activity there? Uh, that's a tougher one to say. Just We can just say the amount of hydrothermal activity is greater than we initially thought or perhaps less than we initially thought. We definitely think there's hydrothermal activity there. This would just tell us something about the degree of that activity. Next question, operator. Thank you. Our next question comes from Mark Caro with Aviation Week and Space Technology. Go ahead with your question. Thanks. Uh, I wonder if you might uh, further characterize the sort of molecular um, chemistry you're looking for in the plumes, what would be intriguing to you at this point based on what you know, and you might um, add the, the kinds of elements that might be in these molecular structures. And uh, just a second question, um, how might your findings uh, help inform a Europa mission in the future? Okay. As, as far as the molecular structures that we might find, both of our spectrometers, both for the gas and the particles, can detect molecules up to a size of about 100 atomic mass units. You can think of that as protons and neutrons. And so we can't detect anything any bigger than that particular mass range. But we can detect fragments from larger molecules, and we expect to see, uh, we've seen methane, ethane, some of the shorter-chained hydrocarbons, and we expect then to see perhaps the longer-chained hydrocarbons, maybe C6, C7, you know, C8, C9, as, as part of that uh, activity going on. Uh, as far as the relationship to the Europa mission, uh, Kurt, you want to take that? Sure. I think there's there's a few areas this could help for your open mission. First and foremost, if we see a difference in the plume composition and plume measurements based upon altitude above the surface, what that tells us for Europa is that we need to be sure that we plan the mission such that it can get very close to the plume uh, origin. Uh, secondly, what it can tell us is how to fine-tune the instruments that we're going to carry along with us. They're, they're still in the design stages. So there is sufficient time for us to make tweaks to those designs that will really optimize the science analyses we can do for plumes that are possibly erupting on Europa as well. Thank you. Our next question comes from Leo Enright with Irish Television. You may ask your question. Uh, thanks very much for doing this. Uh, that, uh, I have a related question, uh, and that is, when would you realistically expect to go back uh, to Enceladus. I mean, it's five or six years since NASA and the European Space Agency decided to prioritize a, a Europa-Jupiter system mission uh, ahead of Titan-Saturn. So I just wonder, when might you reasonably expect to go back? Uh, and it, do you think maybe you, the findings from this flyby might feed into that uh, weighing of the two options? Uh, that, that's a great question, and it's one that we grapple with on, on a daily basis as the discoveries at Enceladus just make it more and more attractive from a scientific point of view. Uh, getting together a mission is, is a very long process, as you're probably aware. So we're not revisiting priorities right now, but I think, uh, but we are considering other missions that could follow Cassini that would focus on Enceladus. But I think the, the important thing in the near term that we take away from this is not so much which destination we go back to, but how those destinations all fit together in understanding the solar system and what we can learn from one destination, from one mission, that we can apply to others. Thank you. Our next question comes from Stephen Clark with Space Flight Now. And again, if you have a question, just press star 1. 
Hi, thanks. Stephen Clark, uh, Space Flight Now. Um, most of my questions have been asked and answered, but uh, I have a couple. Uh, uh, first, maybe for uh, for Linda, can you describe the mood of the of the science team since um, you know following up on that last question, you may be getting your last look at Enceladus, uh, you know, for uh, several or at least a decade or more uh, with this flyby and the one in December. And for Earl, uh, can you just update us on the uh, health of the Cassini spacecraft after 11 years at Saturn? You know, two more years to go before the end of the mission. Uh, how's it doing? Thanks a lot. As far as the mood of the science, there's a feedback. Here. As far as the mood of the science team, there's a lot of excitement about this particular flyby, and also we're starting to realize as a group that we're getting toward the the end of the mission. After this flyby, just a single more flyby of Enceladus, a more distant one, coming up in December. But we're certainly all eagerly awaiting the scientific results from this deep plunge through the plume. Yeah, just to pile onto that uh, mood thing, the, the flight team also feels a certain sense of both, you know, maybe a half uh, things going, you know, last for everything, but the sense is mostly of accomplishment. Uh, they're just absolutely exultant in the successes of this mission. And we're putting a capstone on to the Enceladus encounters, the icy satellites, and then often to the proximal orbits is just a real sense of exhilaration and accomplishment. Relative to the spacecraft, it's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, we're running low on propellant, as we should be towards the end of a mission. You don't want to finish with a lot of gas in the tank. The instruments, we've lost one, uh, the uh, plasma spectrometer. But everything else is working well. We've worked around some of the, some of the um, bumps in the night. The uh, warranties expired an awful lot of components, but they're still functioning just flawlessly. Uh, I've got to say the ground and the spacecraft assets are in great shape, and we're looking forward to completing everything just the way we plan. Okay, and with that operator, we're going to take one more call, and then, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go back to social media again, send those questions in at hashtag AskNASA. So, um, operator, one more question, and then social media. Okay, we have a question from Lauren Grush with The Verge. Let me ask her question. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, so I was wondering if we could go into a little more detail about how you guys characterize uh, habitability, like what, what, you, what ingredients would make it much more likely to have life there than not. Is there anything in particular you're excited to find? As far as the habitability question, you want to know, first of all, you have liquid water for life like we know it on Earth. That's very key. Then you want to know if you have the right energy available. In this case, the hydrothermal vents are providing that source of energy. And then also the question of composition. Do you have the right kinds of ingredients? And we see that in the organic molecules. We know there's carbon dioxide there as well. Uh, we've also been able to measure that we have a salty ocean. It's slightly salty. And so that also is similar to the Earth's ocean. Uh, we think that the, the pH of the ocean falls in an intermediate range, maybe of 9 to 12, so again, a favorable kind of condition for life. So we are basically taking these pieces of the puzzle that we get back from the, the composition and the energy, putting them together to form this picture of a potentially habitable ocean on Enceladus. So this is Dwayne Brown for Media. We're going to uh, come back to you in a few minutes. We're going to take a few more social media, and uh, then we'll wrap up with any more media calls. So, uh, again, we'll go back to Jason Townsend on social media. Jason? Sure. This first question comes from Ustream. One of our viewers there asks, uh, Luke asks, uh, how long have you been planning this flyby? Earl, do you want to start yeah. that? Yes. Yeah. We, we, we planned this flyby five years ago. We have the entire seven, last seven years of the mission choreographed back when we began and got approval for what we're calling the Solstice Mission. So this has been on the books for a long time. Yeah, I can add to that that since the discovery of the Enceladus plume in 2005, we've basically uh, refocused our Cassini tour to try and include as many flybys of Enceladus as we can. And so by our final flyby, we'll have had 22 close flybys to Enceladus and other opportunities to study, in particular, the, the plume itself at a greater distance. Great. Next question comes from Twitter user Cameron, who asks, besides spectrometer data, what other data will Cassini be collecting from the flyby? 
Well, besides spectrometer data, we'll also be collecting images uh, inbound, uh, looking at Enceladus and in closest approach, basically dragging the frame across for the narrow and wide-angle camera, then more images of the plume backlit as we go outbound. And at the same time as the images, we'll also be getting data in uh, other wavelengths from the ultraviolet through the near-infrared and into the far-infrared, as well as both the gas and the plume data. Also, uh, we get uh, measurements of the local environment in situ, not just of the gas and particles, but we'll be looking at the plasma as we come in and go out from Enceladus. So we'll really be using our entire suite of Cassini instruments uh, as we fly through the plume. Next question comes from Twitter user Scott, who asks, how close to dangerous is the altitude of this pass, and were you tempted to go lower? <laughs> I can help. We were tempted to go lower, uh, and we would have, could have gone lower, more safe, as, and still felt like we were safe. But there were a couple of, of trades that we made that, that chose um, – uh, made us decide not to. I'll speak to the one engineering trade, and Linda can speak to the science trades. Uh, it would have cost us some more fuel, and we really felt that that fuel could have been better used in other parts of the mission. So that's the engineering part of it. Uh, it would have been safe to go lower, but there were also some science components to that as well. Did. Yeah, as you go lower, it just also makes the flyby that much shorter as you go whizzing through the plume. So standing off just a little bit more gives us a uh, a few more tens of seconds to look at the data itself. And then the scientists themselves also thought that using that extra fuel to get to a very exciting set of proximal orbits at the end of the mission was definitely the right trade to make. We want to uh, definitely get through to those orbits. Next question comes from Twitter user Jason who asks, how long could Enceladus's oceans continue to spray out in space? Will it ever, quote, unquote, run out? That's a very good question. That's a very good question indeed. It, it's possible that that ocean might have been there since the time Enceladus formed. We don't know for sure. The fact that it's a global ocean leads us to think in that direction. Uh, the, the mass that it's losing per day uh, tells us that, that those plumes and jets could continue to erupt for a very, very, very long time. So I haven't made an estimate of that given the total volume of the ocean. But certainly you don't have to worry about in our lifetime or any any time soon uh, that the, the plume might run out. All right, next question comes from Twitter user Tom, who asks, after the flyby, could there be a possibility of a surface sample mission to find out how Enceladus's oceans in the years to come? We, uh, we actually studied that uh, a few years ago, or about eight years ago, after we first saw the plumes. Uh, and it's a very intriguing possibility. It, it's a very difficult mission to pull off. If you've ever looked at the highest resolution pictures of the surface of Enceladus, and we'll be getting some more back soon, it's a very rough place to land, a very difficult place to land. Um, but the, jo the joy of Enceladus is that you don't need to land. It is spewing samples into space. So if you can just fly by at the right trajectory, at the right velocity, you can grab some great samples. Uh, next question comes from Twitter user Mac, who asks, will there be enough info gathered for exobiologists to do a microcosm lab experiment on the potential for life? Uh, no, there won't. In fact, we were discussing sample size just the other day, and somebody passed around a small vial that indicated how much actual, the amount of water you would actually get in a sample from a Cassini flyby. And it's, it's literally a small drop. <clears throat> But that's how sensitive our instruments are. With just a very tiny drop of water, we can deduce a lot of things about the ocean. Last question here for this round of social questions uh, from Alice on Twitter, who asks, how long will it be until we get reports back on what was found? Linda, you want to start yeah, that? Yeah. For the pictures, we'll probably get this Earl mentioned um, perhaps Thursday night, more likely Friday morning, uh, by the time we try and process out some of the smear. For the spectrometers, for the particles and gas, there'll be a first quick look within about a week, but then it may take several more weeks to do the more complete and thorough analysis uh, on what we find there. All right, we'll continue on with social questions here. This next one comes from uh, Twitter user Cosmic, who asks, 
If this turns out to be a perfect mission, what results will you be expecting to achieve? For a perfect flyby, I think if we just get the data back safely to the ground and uh, make some new uh, new findings about what material might be there and, and put those pieces then together to tell us about what's going on in Enceladus. And I, I would say that Cassini has already been a perfect mission. It, it has completely exceeded our expectations. <clears throat> and when you factor in what we have left to come in the next two years, it's going to be uh, even more amazing. All right, last question here from Anshul, who asks, Cassini end, is, end life is expected to be in 2017. What more is Cassini up to? Yeah. Uh, Cassini has a lot more in store. We have our final Enceladus flyby in December, and then we're starting the climb to our final set of orbits. Uh, first, we'll pull in our periaps, our closest approach of it, each orbit, in very close to Saturn's F-ring and get some very detailed high-resolution views of those outermost rings of Saturn. We'll also get a chance to fly very close to some of these tiny ring moons uh, that are basically, some of them potato-shaped, very oddly shaped, and to study those in more detail. And then in April 2017, we actually hop across the entire ring system of Saturn and spend 22 orbits inside of a 2,000-kilometer-wide gap between the innermost ring and the top of Saturn's atmosphere. And here's a chance to have a brand new mission for Cassini. We'll look at the planet's gravity and magnetic fields in exquisite detail, measure the mass of the rings for the very first time, get in situ measurements that will directly measure the composition of the ring particles, as well as tell us about the composition of Saturn's upper atmosphere. So it will be an incredible end for the Cassini mission. Then on our final orbit, uh, we'll, I, Cassini will go out in what I call a, a blaze of glory as we go into Saturn's atmosphere uh, on that very last orbit. And at that point, Cassini, the spacecraft itself, will be vaporized. And you can imagine all of the molecules of Cassini now spread across and being part of Saturn itself. Excellent. Thank you all. Okay, folks, well, we're going to uh, wrap up actually early, and that's... Uh Testament to a great team, great presentations, great questions. I want to thank Kurt, Earl, Linda, and the entire Cassini team. Um, as, as Kurt said, it's already been perfect mission, and it's still going. And ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned for uh, what we will post uh, following the Wednesday, October 28th event. Uh, watch www.nasa.gov slash Cassini. Again, www.nasa.gov slash Cassini for the latest updates images, and let's see what surprises we will get down the road. And with that, uh, operator, please close us out. Thank you. That does conclude today's conference. We thank you for your participation. At this time, you may disconnect your lines.